Hey guys, it's Chris. Sunday night, Q&A with Chris. We're live. I'm in my kitchen. I tried to get this tripod to work, but I haven't quite figured out how to use this tripod yet because I know some of you were asking if I could demonstrate with the racket. So I'm working on that. We're going to try to get this piece of equipment up and running. I appreciate you guys tuning in. It's going to be a big show. We have a lot of momentum and energy today. We had a great show live this morning on the court. So I'm kind of wondering if anyone has some questions about that, about the live show. I did some technical work this morning with a couple of my players and we were working on serve technique and slice backhand technique and some other stuff. I thought it was a really good show and we had a lot of people tuning into that. So that was really cool to get such a great turnout. And I also would like to take all your tennis questions this Sunday night. We had a big show two Sunday nights ago. I'm sorry I missed you guys. Last Sunday I was traveling to Panama to an ITF with a player and it was a great week of tennis, but I couldn't get the show rolling. And I really wanted to do a show from Panama, but I just couldn't, I couldn't work it into the schedule. It was a very, very busy week down in Panama with great weather, by the way. It was 87 degrees and I got to wear shorts all day. Not like in New York City, which was super cold. But I see a lot of people tuning in already. Mark Frampton is watching. Thank you for tuning in. Pablo Belitsky is watching. Carlos Carreras waving. Thank you, Carlos. Rosario Escola Retuerta. Sorry if I mispronounced your names, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Jason Yang is watching. Indra Mayu is watching. Thanks for waving, guys. We've got a great turnout. We usually have a pretty busy show on Sunday night. I really appreciate you guys tuning in and supporting the show and supporting my work. If you have any tennis questions, please let me know and I'll do my best to answer. I am a development coach, primarily working with top junior players and uh, beginning players up, up to very advanced players, but serious players. So that's sort of my specialty. If you have questions about junior development, that's right up my alley. If you have questions about Spanish tennis, I wrote a book on Spanish tennis. So that's one of my areas of expertise as well. I have a few thoughts for you guys on Spanish tennis. So I will be Hoping to get into that. It's been sort of on my mind all week. I've been thinking about Spanish tennis and what's happening in Spain and what the future is for Spanish tennis. So I think I'll share some of those comments with you guys as well. Some of those thoughts. I see Marcelo Arredondo is waving. Thank you so much for tuning in. Derek Landon Brooks, my Facebook friend. What's up, buddy? Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for waving. Alejandro Mauricio, thanks for waving. I've got my first question of the night from my buddy Jim Kane from Massachusetts. What's up, Jim? You have a question for me or are you just saying you're enjoying the show? Let's see. My friend Tim Bainton is watching. What's up, Tim? Thanks for waving. Thanks for joining the conversation. I know you love talking tennis. If you have any questions or thoughts, throw them out to me and I will do my best to answer, guys. Has anyone seen my new branding where I'm talking about the next gen Spanish method? I'm really into this idea of the next gen Spanish style training and I think it's going to be my brand moving forward and I'm really concerned about what's happening to the old generation of Spanish training and I feel like Spanish training is actually under assault right now, actually direct assault from multiple, maybe from multiple coordinates from different from different uh, perspectives but for example I think Spanish tennis is in big trouble in terms of its reputation in terms of its stand standing in the industry and I think people in Spain academies in Spain and coaches in Spain need to wake up really fast because there's a movement going on to undercut the legitimacy of Spanish training, to undercut the primacy of Spanish training, and to rally against Spanish training and try to 
I don't know how to say it, but, but trying to maybe sur supplant, that's a good word, supplant Spanish training as the leader in the world. And I think coaches and academies in Spain need to really wake up really quick and start to adjust their branding. So that's something that's on my mind this week. I see my buddy Ben Sterner is watching. What's up, Ben? Thanks for waving. Lucas Biondi, my old student, very talented young player. I guess he's not so young anymore, but Lucas has been to Spain with me. He knows what it's all about. He's played on the red clay there. Very talented young player. Lucas, where are you at? Are you in college yet? Or are you going to college soon? Are you still playing? Hopefully you're still in the game. I see I have some other friends from internationally. Uh, international locations. Thanks for watching, guys. If you have any tennis questions, development questions, what I really love to do on Sunday nights is I love to answer questions from parents who have kids, maybe kids who can't, uh, can't connect with a great coach, they can't connect with quality coaching in their area, and I really enjoy as a service helping parents and kids who are maybe from an area that, that doesn't have access to high level coaching. I love answering questions from those types of viewers. So if you have a development question, if you have a kid, and you're from an area that maybe, maybe you don't have regular access to good coaching, high quality coaching, please, please don't be shy and let me know what your questions are. Maybe I can help you and your family. That's one of my great joys is providing that service. I see Tim has a question. Tim says, first question of the night. Spanish training is the leader, but adjusting is important. Can you be a little more specific on that, Tim? I will tell you that Spanish training may not be the leader in the next decade. I think Spanish tennis needs to rebrand. I'm currently rebranding as next gen Spanish training. And I'll, I can kind of go into what that means. And I'll, I can go through some of the, the checkpoints or the bullet points about what the next generation of Spanish tennis training should look like. But I don't think Spain is gonna be the leader. They're not the leader on tour anymore in terms of top players in, in the ATP 100 or WTA. They never were the leader in WTA. But their, their players are older. I've written a lot about this. Their players are older. Their native-born players are older. And they are losing players out, out, out of the top 100. Rafa's going to retire soon, let's face it. And the wave is ending. The great wave, maybe two waves, two generations even, starting in maybe the mid to late 80s. And I'm not sure what's going to happen to the reputation of Spanish tennis moving forward. I, I've written that I think Spain will become like Florida as a place for people to go train. It'll be known as a training hub with some very good training and academies and coaches. But I think we're definitely seeing a decline in the number of top players on tour from Spain, the native-born players. There's still a lot of international players training in Spain. So the training modality is still very good. Okay, question from Tim. As a great coach, what are generic high-level coaching tips? What are my go-to secrets? Tim, that's too general a question. I can maybe give a few, uh, a few pieces of advice. I don't like the word tips. I never use the word tips in any of my videos or writings because tips to me is something that kind of comes and goes, it's kind of ephemeral and fleeting or maybe inconsequential. And I like giving advice that has more import. But I would say as a junior developer, I'll give an example. I was working all day today on court and I had a little boy come to me with great heart and great competitive spirit, but he didn't have the technique or the technical foundation. And so I would say one of my most important pieces of advice for coaches and parents is get the technique right. Get it as perfect as you can when a kid is young. And if I know coaches who do that exclusively, maybe they forget to work on other things like tactics and the mental side and 
even the physical side, but they do technique well. And I think if you give a kid a good technical foundation with really high level skills, complete skills, high level technique, and we can debate what that means. That's a big debate. What is high level technique? So that's a whole nother discussion. But if you can get the technique good at a young age, you give that kid a tremendous advantage in the, the race to be a champion. And it doesn't mean they're going to be a champion because there's more to a player than technique. But man, it really helps. So I would say my number one piece of advice that's on my mind tonight, especially because I was working with this little boy today and he's got some technical work to do, I would say that that is the big one. That is a big one, to get the technique right in, in all aspects. Serve, the big three are serve, forehand, and backhand, and footwork. So maybe the big four, the footwork ties everything together. You've got to get the footwork really nice and smooth and agile, player, player with good agility and balance, and you've got to get the big forehand, big elastic forehand, and a nice modern backhand, probably going to be a two-handed backhand nowadays. Occasionally a one-handed backhand, but and then a big time serve. And I think if you're doing that, you're on the right track. But guys, send me your development questions. I made a special shout out to any parents who might have students who are parents who might have a kid who is from an area that where they don't have access to high-level coaching. You guys are my priority. I love all my other fans, but parents with kids who have burning questions, they're not sure what to do in terms of development, in terms of technique or tactics or anything, physical, mental. I, I spend a lot of time on my email answering questions from parents around the world, and I do it for free. I do it as a service because I wanna help kids. I love helping kids. I'm very passionate about helping kids succeed. So that's what I would say uh, if you have any questions about junior development, shoot them out to me. I take questions from anyone though. If you're an adult and you want questions about your game, I'm happy to try to help even though I'm primarily a junior developer. If you have questions about the industry, we've been talking about Spanish tennis and I will keep going because I have a lot of concerns about what's happening in the industry with Spanish tennis vis-a-vis -vis Spanish tennis. I'm very concerned about the branding, I'm, I'm concerned about the way Spanish tennis is being boxed in, and many people are talking about Spanish tennis as a historical side note almost, as if Spanish tennis is in the past already, and it's not quite in the past yet, not quite in the rearview mirror, but a lot of people in the industry, leaders are, are starting to uh, criticize Spanish tennis, attack some of the values of Spanish tennis, Spanish tennis training, the efficacy of Spanish tennis training. I'm very concerned about this, but I hear, I hear a lot of themes around the industry now, and, and they are undermining the legitimacy of Spanish training, and almost talking about Spanish training as if using the past tense, like it's over, you know, m let's move on. It was, a, it was a, a fad, so to speak, which I certainly don't think it was. I got Charles Crowley, watching. Thanks for the wave. Thanks for the shout out. Let's see what I'm, I can check in on some comments here. Sorry, I got a little lost on my Spanish training monologue there. Donnie Levitt is watching, friend of the family. Thanks so much. Michael Furman, my business manager and new student with the brand new big Spanish forehand and the great two-handed backhand. I'm surprised that you made that change, Michael. But I'm with you, man. That was cool. Laura Glitz is watching. Let's see what we got. Tim Baden is in the house with his questions. Tim, it's great to have you on board tonight. Let's see what you got. Chris, you are a grinder and not a celebrity, which I appreciate. You have this audience. What's on one thing that coaches should pay attention to? Okay, well, I was talking about technique. And if, you're if you want to know... What I think is high level technique, well that's part of the whole, that's part of the magic. And you can check out the YouTube channel or some of the courses we'll be doing. I have a coaching course on technique coming up February 18th and 19th at my club 
I'm super excited about that. Coaches can come and we can, we're going to go through my whole technical system there and talk about developing prodigies. So, Tim, I want to be a celebrity soon. What is this? I'm not a celebrity now, but I, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to build up this audience so I can be more of an influencer around the world. Let's see. I have a good question. Tim, send me another specific question if you have one. John Logan Minier. I don't know if I got that right, John. I'm sorry. Technique overhitting a lot early on. I've seen both work with different players and different coaches. Hmm. Can you can you resend and be a little more specific, John? Because I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Are you saying that some coaches work too much on technique and they lose track of other important parts of the game? Let me know what you're thinking there and I'll try to answer. Okay, my good buddy Liam Crawl. Yeah, Liam, you're here. Liam, where are you at? You in Bronxville? Dude, we got to connect. We got to play some sets. I heard you're playing pretty well, but I'm still playing too. You haven't beat me yet. How do we feel about the next current generation of, of the American tennis player? Great question. The girls are unbelievable. U.S. women, dominant wave, maybe two dominant waves coming. Just incredible from the U.S. women. Watch out, guys. U.S. women dominating the world. The men are coming back. They're doing well. We have some talent. It's not as big a wave as the women. Maybe we'll catch a wave soon, Liam. Maybe you can be part of the wave, bud. You can make it on tour. That's what I have to say. I think... It's going to be tough on the men's side. It might take another decade. I'm not sure. But we're going to be solid, like more solid than before. You know? Okay. We've got some good questions. Let's see. Jeremy Malfay, my buddy. Thanks for tuning in, Jeremy. Do you believe technique should always be taught with tactics? It's a great, great question. And he says, by the way... Return should be in the top three. Yeah, I was thinking about adding return to that, and I actually agree with you. But the return is, there's not as much technique at the fundamental level as with serve. Serve is much more technical than return. And when you're working with young kids, in my opinion, the forehand and backhand technique, that is the return. They're, they're not doing that much different technically because the serves aren't coming that fast. So I absolutely agree with you. Return needs to be taught more. It is not taught enough. I teach it a lot to my older students. I spend a little less time on it with the younger ones. But absolutely agree with you. Returns very important. Okay, technique. Should it always be taught with tactics? No. I don't believe so. Especially with kids who struggle with technique or they struggle with motor learning. They need technique. And if you try to teach them tactics with the technique, it's confusing. I want to say like they say in Spain, it's confusing. It's confusing for them and they won't learn the technique as efficiently. So to hyper-focus on technique with kids who are less gifted, motorically, I think it's the way to go. With a little more gifted kids, so you're talking more on the prodigy line, prodigy angle, on the more gifted end of the bell curve, you can definitely start to work both and it can be sometimes more efficient that way because you can get, you can get some tactical work in along with the technique. So I would, that's how I, that's how I see it. I think that coaches who divorce technique from tactics exclusively, like there are coaches who believe that philosophically, they believe that technique should be taught completely separate from tactics. I think that's a shame because a lot of times you can get more efficiency by introducing some tactical concepts to a kid while they're working on repetition and muscle memory. However, I'm telling you there's a lot of kids out there, if they're not that talented motorically, and you start giving them a lot of tactical talk while they're trying to learn technique, it's overwhelming for them. It's too much for them. And they will do better off and they will have less anxiety and they won't get as confused 
and they will make progress faster in their technique if you try to hyper focus on the technical side. So that's that's what I would say regarding that. I hope that helps answer your question. Send me any follow up if you have it. Okay. We got a very busy show tonight. Sunday nights are blowing up on this program. I'm really happy to have so many people tuning in. Melissa Tafoya, I think you're a regular. Thanks for watching, Melissa. I really appreciate it. Marcelo Arredondo, I think you're also a regular of the show, a regular viewer. Thank you so much. What do you think about the difficulty for players who enter the ATP circuit and cannot keep up because of deficiencies in their nutrition and lack of budget. Well, nutrition would be the fault of the player. That's the player's responsibility to understand good nutritional habits. So I don't know what to say about that. If they're not eating right, that's a shame and they don't deserve to move up the ladder. But in terms of budget, that is a major issue all across the professional tours right now. Players don't have a lot of money. It's very hard to break through. I think the ITF and the World Tours are trying to resolve that with some of the new structure you see coming in 2019. The powers that be are really trying to spread the money to lower level players so that they can make it on the tour. In my personal opinion, I think a guy 1,000 in the world or a female player 1,000 in the world, they should be able to earn a living. Those are pretty good players. Anywhere between 500 and 1,000 they're very accomplished players. It's a shame that those players are losing money. They can't play professional. You take the 500 to 1,000th player in any other sport, and they're making a really good living. You know, that's talked about a lot, and I completely agree with that. So I think that the prize money needs to be distributed better on the pro circuit. And I think a player 1,000 in the world who busts their butt and gets that good, they should be, they should be able to make, I don't know, 100 grand. 100 to 200 grand, like a league minimum kind of deal, and they should, they should be able to support themselves. But that's not the way it is right now. The guy 1,000 in the world is feeding balls at your local country club to try to scrape some money together so he can go out and tour for six months. That's kind of what's happening right now. All right, what do we got? Trying to get... Guys, send me any follow-ups. If I didn't answer your question completely, let me know, and I will try to follow up as best I can, okay? I have a lot of... A lot of friends on tonight. Adrian Filippini, I think is a regular on the show. Thank you for tuning in. Adinarayana Potugari, that's, thank you so much for waving. Matthew Tanilanand is waving. Thank you so much. David Poole is watching. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's my Q&A show Sunday night, every Sunday night, 9.30 p.m. New York City time, unless I'm traveling, which sometimes I am. I just came back from Panama. It's a lot of fun at an ITF tournament with one of my players. Bobby Blair has a question. What age should a kid go full-time in development with homeschool, etc., if they have the true potential of a top 50 pro career? That is an awesome question, and I'm probably going to get flamed for saying this, but I don't have an issue if a kid goes full-time at any age, and I don't care how young they are. So... I'm talking about really, really talented kids who know they want to play tennis, they know they want to be number one, they know they want to be the best in the world, and let's do it. Don't hold your kid back. Depends on the kid, obviously, depends on their maturity and, and where they're at, but I know for a fact that the kids who make it on the world tour and I don't mean making it like top 100. I mean like potential Grand Slam winners. Not even like you said, top 50. I'm talking top 10 Grand Slam contenders, best of all time. Those kids are developed from the crib to be champions. Not from 9 or 10 or 11 years old. Those kind of champions. The most elite, the farthest to the right on the bell curve. Those kids are pretty much born and bred to be great champions. Their parents usually have that in mind while the kid's in the womb. Take the Williams sisters and Richard Williams as case in point. You know, So I don't have a problem with a young, young kid getting really serious and trying to 
train full time. I don't care what how old they are. That being said, for the typical kid who's going to play top college, you know, a little less to the right on the extreme of the bell curve, talented but not that talented, maybe not emotionally ready or mature enough. Most kids are starting homeschool between the age of 12 and 14. It's typical. But those aren't the most gifted ones. I'm saying, I'm talking about the, the best of the best, the most elite of the elite. But the typical prodigy elite kid is 12 to 14 generally, maybe anywhere between 6th and 8th grade, sometimes ninth grade, and the kids start to get more serious then. And those kids all end up Division I college, and they, they may go out on the pro tour, but they're not winning grand slams typically, I'll tell you that much. There's a big difference between being on the pro tour, being a thousand in the world, and even being top 100, and then there's a whole nother level being top 10 in the world and trying to legitimately have a shot to win a grand slam, let alone be one of the best players of all time. So that's how I see that. John says, Got it right. No one ever does. I like you now. L-O-L. John, what did I say? No one ever does. I lost you, man. Tell me, what, what was it? I'm glad you like me now, but you don't have to like me, but I'm going to say it the way I see it. That's, I'm just a straight shooter, and I don't mind the haters. I figure if you're going to go have your own show on YouTube, there's going to be some people that flame you, and that's just the way it is. You got to be tough, just like when you're at a tournament. You got to deal with it. Tim Bainton says, Chris, you got cut off, Tim. Shoot it back to me again if you'd like. Guys, we're having a very busy show, a lot of lively conversation. I'm pretty pumped because I finished my weekend marathon of teaching. I've been teaching all weekend, teach about 24 hours on the weekend. It's a grind. Good thing I've been training in Spain, so I'm ready for a grind. I like to grind. Makes you tougher. Let's see. John says, yes, I'm saying I've seen coaching have 90% focus on technique, and their players don't rally much early on, but others rally 90% and almost no focus on the finer points of technique early on. But in the end, they both end up with good hitters at 14 to 16 years old. Yes, there are two diametrically opposed philosophies in coaching. One is you have highly technical-minded coaches. I call them technicians. And they believe that the technique is paramount and technique should be taught first. Technique should be taught exclusively. A lot of those types of coaches believe that technique is everything in the game. For example, my old coach was very, very technical, Gilad Bloom. Sometimes he joins the program, Israeli coach, Russian coaches tend to be extremely technical, Eastern European coaches. They really believe that technique is pretty much everything, especially in the younger years. And on the other side, you have tacticians who are, you know, live ball guys. They don't like doing a lot of drills. They try to do everything tactical with decision making. And then there's coaches everywhere in between. So I think that's what we're kind of talking about. But if you, you know, I know right away when I'm talking to coaches at a workshop or a conference. And if they start talking from a certain angle, I know, I, I know right away if they're a technician or if they're a tactician. And it affects the way they see the game. It affects the way they see uh, development. And I think it depends on the student. Some students need a lot of extra technical work and some students can do more of a combo deal, technical, tactical. And some students who are really, really gifted and they learn super fast and they have tremendous, they have this tremendous ability to mimic and they can, you can put on a video of a pro and they can copy it perfectly. I know players like that. I've had students like that. They don't need a lot of technical work. They got it. They got it just visually. They're, they're amazing. They have something very special in their wiring, in their nervous system, in their brain. And those kids don't need a lot of technical work. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you got kids who are, they really struggle motorically. They're a little clumsy. They don't have the coordination. And those kids need a lot of help technically. All right, let's see what we got here. 
I'm sorry if I'm missing some questions here, guys. I'm trying to follow my comments here, but sometimes the commentary gets cut off. I did a show uh, a, short a short while back, and I actually didn't get some of the comments. So I really apologize if I missed your comment, but I really do try to answer everyone. I'm not trying to avoid answering any questions unless they're just hateful, but I haven't had any haters today. I'm so thankful for that. Florin Barbu is watching. Thank you, Florin. Let me know where you guys are tuning in from. Let me know where you guys are at, if you're international. Let's see. Chucho Bandris is watching. What's up, Chucho? That's an awesome name, buddy. Mark Kovacs is watching. Mark, I'm such a big fan. I'm lauding you wherever you go. You're blowing up, Mark. I tell everyone, I was there. 10, 12 years ago when you were coming up on the speaking circuit and I caught every workshop and every lecture that you gave and I told everyone, I said to myself, this guy is a superstar, this guy is going to blow up and here we are, decade later and you're, you're doing it, you're all over the place, you're probably one of the most intelligent analysts, sports scientists out there. Keep it up, buddy. What do we got? Jeremy says, exactly, it depends on the student. No pro should be just a technician or whatever. It's all situational. Yes, and that is one issue that I have with uh, red ball curriculums right now. They are heavily weighted towards tactical development and decision making with young children. And I think that's great if you have a talented young kid who picks up technique very fast, but I know for a fact there's a lot of kids out there, they, they're motorically challenged, they don't have the coordination, and I'm telling you, they need more technical work, they need more traditional repetition, they might even need to be in a line once in a while and do some dry feeding uh, with detail, and the red ball curriculums right now, which are heavily weighted towards magician type kids and great decision uh, they focus on decision making and they they don't account for individual learning style different 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 you need a different approach depending on the kid in front of you so that's how I see it I would like to see the red ball completely revamped with modern technique by the way I think the the skill set that we teach at red ball and orange is very rudimentary it's very old school very traditional it's not cutting edge. I would like to see the whole red ball curriculum modernized, focusing on elasticity, modern stances, modern swing paths, everything at red ball level. I don't think we should teach old technique and then change it to modern technique later. And I think red ball should account for in different types of learning styles. And for kids that need more repetition, we should do that for them. We shouldn't just be beholden to this philosophy of only uh, of primarily decision making and then some technical work. Some kids need a lot more repetition and technical work than the current red ball curriculums provide. All right. Sorry guys. I maybe I got off on a rant there, but all right, let's see what we got here. Thank you Mark. Thank you for that. I'm serious, man. Keep it up. I'm following all your work and actually I try to teach all of my students technique that falls within the evidence-based parameters that you provide. A lot of times I will check my work against your research and it's been incredibly helpful to my coaching and I can't thank you enough for that. And I think that all coaches should have, should make sure that they're, the technique that they're teaching is, has some support and evidence, is somewhat evidence-based or at least is with, with, within what's available in current research. They should try to teach within those parameters. And so many coaches are off doing God knows what, teaching their opinion or what they learned or what, they're, what, they've, what they see at their club or what their tennis director tells them to coach or what somebody at a conference said. And I'm a big believer that when we teach, we should teach as much as possible within evidence-based parameters. And so many coaches don't do that. And it's dangerous because how do you know what you're teaching and if it's going to work or if it's safe, if you don't have any research behind it. So we don't have enough research, but at least start with some, try to teach based on some evidence, especially with technique. All right. 
John says, that's how I do it. New technique, and then the kids get insanely good. I love it. Well, I'm glad you like it, John. I think we see eye to eye or face to face, mano a mano. My buddy Pablo Nombella says, hi, what's up, Pablo? Thanks for working so hard with Adam. I appreciate it. We're having a great show tonight. My Sunday night show is blowing up. I'm here to answer all your questions, guys. I'm here to try to help, try to share some wisdom. I don't know it all, but I've been in this junior development business for a while now, and I think I have good perspective. And I especially am trying to help parents and families from areas that don't have a lot of good coaching, especially international families who may not have access to high-level coaching. You guys are my number one. I love all you other guys, but parents with families who, who have maybe dads or moms with kids and they're not sure what to do with their kids, that's my number one passion. So if you're out there, you have an have a, a up-and-coming little superstar, let me know, and I will do my best to try to help and give you the best information I can. All right. Martine, what's up? Thanks for waving, buddy. Brandon, thanks for waving. Got some old friends on the show. Arcady, thanks for waving. Arcady's a regular on my Sunday night show. Thanks, Arcady. It's great to have you. Tom Witten is watching. Thanks for waving, guys. Did I miss a question? I'm so sorry if I missed someone's questions. Michael Cable is watching. What's up, Mike? Mike, you're going to come to another workshop? That's awesome. It was great having you. And I'm glad you're using some of that Spanish stuff down in Washington, D.C., is that where it is, or Virginia. But I'm telling you, watch out. There's a big movement against Spanish tennis right now in the industry, and I'm going to have to start speaking out, and maybe I'm going to have to call up some of my friends in Spain and say, guys, wake up. Everyone's moving against you right now. You've got to wake up and start defending yourself and maybe even evolving. How about that? We've got a real problem in Spain with the coaching system and the academies and... The leaders in Spain, the leadership in the industry in Spain, are, they are not evolving fast enough and the world evolves and other systems are evolving. And coaching is a competitive arena and I think Spanish tennis is in big trouble. Not, I don't mean just on the tour because there's no doubt the tour numbers are going down. I'm talking about Spanish coaching and the methodology. So some of you may know if you've read my book, The Secrets of Spanish Tennis, you may kind of know what I'm talking about, but a lot of the stuff I talked about in that book are some of the positive things that they do in Spain. But what I'm concerned about is they're not evolving and adding new elements to their teaching methodology. And I can go into it if anyone's curious about what I'm talking about. I should probably write the book about maybe what they could do better in Spain. I think I have a very unique perspective on that. But I talk a lot about what they do well in Spain, but on the flip side, I'm going to start talking more about what they need to do better in Spain because seriously, Spain needs to evolve. Spanish coaches need to evolve and otherwise they're going to get, their reputation is going to get burned and they're going to start losing a lot of business and players and all that. All right, what do we got? Questions. Any development questions, guys? Any international families need help? I'm here in New York City, but I love coaching around the world. John Guerrero is watching. Thanks for waving. Chalurm Sri Kwan. I'm so sorry. I totally messed that one up. It's really shameful as an English major, Ivy League, literature major, that I can't pronounce all these international names. I do apologize, but I really thank you for tuning in and watching and waving. Have a very big show tonight. Sunday nights are always an exciting show. Okay, do you guys want me to get into the Spanish stuff? Number one thing that could do better in Spain. Is anyone interested? I feel bad saying this because I wrote the book on Spanish tennis about how they do all this good stuff, but they're missing out on a lot of key things. I'll tell you the number one thing. The number one thing that they need to do better in Spain is teach the serve. Number one, there are still many pockets of academies and coaches in Spain completely neglect serve development. That's a big one, big bullet point. And I know the Spanish players are diminutive, 
They're not that tall, but there's way too many academies and places in Spain that spend 90% of the time developing forehand and backhand and running, and they don't develop that big serve weapon. So that's a critical one. That's a big one. Number two, throw out any questions or comments if you have them. Number two, in Spain, biggest thing that Spain has to do to evolve, to get to the next generation of Spanish training methodology, they got to teach better technique. They got to do technique and they have to be a little more precise with the technical parameters for their players. Right now, it's pretty broad, there's a lot of anything goes, and too many players come through that don't have picture-perfect technique. We can debate what that means. They don't have the technique that you need to succeed at the top level. Now, a lot of them do, but there's too many that don't. And that includes the serve. This gets back to the serve, where they don't spend enough time developing the serve, which is the most technical shot in the game. So it's a big issue. Technique and teaching the serve. Those are two. And I have more because I'm writing an article about this, so it's on my mind. And it's been swirling around my mind all week, driving me crazy. And I'm just going to, I'm rebranding my academy and training because I don't want to be labeled as old school Spanish. I want to be known as doing hybrid next gen Spanish. And next gen Spanish means teaching the serve and teaching better technique, paying more attention to technical, maybe having tighter technical parameters. Okay, so those are two, and I can go into some more. I think I have a couple of questions on the board, so I will see what's on here. Guys, I'm pumped tonight. I finished my teaching for the weekend. I'm excited to start a brand new week with a lot of passion and energy, and I'm excited to answer your questions. Arcady says, hi, I was speaking with a friend his son is a top-rated high school player. He regrets that his son didn't take a year off before high school to play in Spain. What do you think of that idea? And if good, is Bruguera still the best academy? Okay. Yes, a lot of kids take that year between 8th grade and ninth grade. Sometimes they repeat 8th grade. That's very common here in New York. I don't know how common that is around the world or around the country, but here in New York, I have had a lot of pretty highly ranked national players do that. Uh, a lot of kids who are getting serious around that age, like I was saying, eighth or ninth grade, they do that. They take like a leap year and they even redo some of eighth grade or they take a gap year. And I think that's a great idea because you can start college a year later, you're more mature and your tennis game is gonna be top notch. I highly recommend that strategy. So there's your answer there. And I still recommend going to Spain to train. I would recommend going to some of the places in Spain that are a little more next gen on the cutting edge. Although it depends on the player's training style. I would say Bruguera. I love Bruguera. I sent so many players to Bruguera. They are the legendary academy. One of the most famous classic academies in Spain. They, they started in the in the 80s and Luis Bruguera has been an incredible mentor to me over the last decade or more he wrote the forward for my book so I'm I'm always gonna be grateful to the Bruguera family and I I studied there it's like a second home there Bruguera Academy so I always recommend Bruguera but that is one of the academies where and I will talk to Luis about it and I will talk to the owner Roberto about it that I really believe they need to get more on the cutting edge with some of their training methods. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that, but they do a fantastic job and the coaches are very caring and it's a, it's a family place. And we can talk about all the other academies too. I think that Rafa's new academy, and this is really interesting from a business perspective and a branding perspective. I don't know if Tim is still on, but Tim, this, you'll find this interesting, but I think Rafa's Academy is positioning themselves as the new Spanish way, the new modern Spanish training, and they are boxing in all the other academies on the mainland as old school. 
I think that's part of their marketing and branding approach. And it's concerning to me because there are still a lot of great academies over on the mainland. Rafa's Academy is in Mallorca, on the island of Mallorca. But I see, when I see a Spanish academy going after the other Spanish academies and telling them that they need to, that they're not evolving and boxing them in and branding them as in the past, that tells me something. And that's coming from a Spanish perspective. And that is a perspective that we're seeing now across m many people in the tennis industry worldwide, not just from, from Rafa's and, and Tony Nadal's perspective. So I think that's very interesting in terms of branding. All right, we have a question about, and if you guys have questions about Spanish academies, I do, I do recommend uh, a lot of different academies to different folks, depending on the, the playing style of their player. There, there's a lot that goes into choosing an academy in Spain because they all have a slightly different feel. So, you know, shoot me a question on Spanish academies if you, if you need advice on that. So, Bruce Sibley is watching. Thanks for waving. Jason Goldman. Petri is watching. What's up, Jason, my Facebook friend? Thanks for waving, buddy. If you have a tennis question, let me know. No cheating, Jason. No cheating. Come on. We're on the same team here. I'm with you, man. I want to end cheating. Okay, guys. If you're out there, we are going to see. I'm making the prediction now that we are going to... Wait, who's this? Wait, who's this? Get in here. Hello. Hello. That's my number one. Hello. Love of my people. life. She's here. What are you doing laundry over doing there? Laundry. That's our laundry back there. Oh, it's so embarrassing. Oh, guys. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. That's okay. That's not part of the show. The laundry is not part of the show. Try to try not. Don't get distracted by that big pile of laundry. Okay. Prediction about cheating. Cheating is going to end. I'm going to say in the next 25 years, it's going to be over. Stick a fork in it, junior level up to the pro level and, and college, it's going to be gone. And the reason it's going to be gone is not because we could get our act together and, and get a solution from the human side. It's going to come from technology. Look at what PlaySight is doing with, play, with the Playfair initiative. Unbelievable. Awesome. Incredible use of technology. I mean, huge, huge fan and proponent of this Playfair, and I'm, they're not sponsoring me. Nobody comment and tell me that I'm getting a commission or anything. I absolutely believe in the Playfair approach, the Playfair uh, initiative that's, that's happening now. It's happening already on college campuses. We're getting challenges and video line calling. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's so great. And it's going to actually end cheating once and for all. Kids and pros and college kids are going to be able to go to a tournament and there's actually going to be zero cheating. No one's getting hooked. No one's going home upset. And we're not going to lose kids who try a tournament for the first time and they get hooked they get cheated, they hate it, and they want to go play some other sport where there's good refereeing. It's not going to happen anymore. It might take 25 years. It's already starting. It's already starting. They have it at college right now. Play fair is, is at some college dual matches now in Division One. They have it. It's going to happen on the Pro Tour, and it's going to happen. I want it to get down to the juniors. Uh, either it's going to be play site technology, or it's going to be some of the other... There's a few other competing technologies in the line calling business and the camera business, but it's going to happen. I'm so excited. I see the future. I know it's going to happen. Okay. I have a question from Scott Groth, and I'll take that one first, and then I have a question from Marcelo. Let's see. How are we doing on time here? Oh, we're doing good. I just keep going. I try to go till I start feeling really sleepy, and then... I gotta say bye bye. But right now I'm feeling pretty good. My energy is high. I'm pumped. I am managing my energy just like I would at a in a futures match. Okay, Scott says, what are you talking about when referring to technique? Grips, setup, swing path, too many mindless reps. Well, technique is all of the things that you mentioned. It is grips, it is swing path, swing shape, 
It is the setup with the feet. I consider footwork technique. So part of teaching technique is teaching footwork and, and balance and body control. And yes, in terms of technique, if you were following the thread before, the conversation before, I was saying that, yes, some coaches do too much mindless repetition. Sometimes the Spanish system gets criticized for doing too many mindless repetitions, although they are not that technical. They do mindless repetitions just for the sake of making players suffer and building endurance and a mental capacity to survive and persevere. But there are many coaches, technical coaches, uh, Eastern European style, Russian style. My old coach was Israeli. Depends on where they're from. I'm just, I'm stereotyping, but it just in general, those regions tend to be very technical. American coaches tend to be quite technical. If you see one of our leading coaches in the U.S., a guy like Rick Macy or a guy like Robert Lansdorp, these guys are extremely technical coaches and they lead, they lead the U.S. A lot of coaches follow their, follow their lead, their role models for American coaches. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of technique. If you have a follow-up, just let me know. All right, what do we got? Marcelo is interested in the ATP tour angle. He says, you think like Rafa Nadal that the ATP does not care of injuries to the top 20 for the programming of tournaments and that frustrates those who are players in training who want to imitate them and enter the ATP circuit. Where Rafa lost just the number one because of his ninth injury. Yes, I, if I understand your question, I completely agree that the ATP schedule is broken. I think tennis, in many ways, if you've listened to some of my conversations in the past, I think tennis is broken. Tennis is broken in many ways. The sport of tennis is broken, but particularly at the pro level, and we can talk about the other levels of the game that are broken. One of the reasons is, like in junior tennis, the cheating aspect, but at the pro level, there should be an off season, in my opinion. I think the season is completely warped. It's, it's wrong. It's, how can I say, it's too long. It is too abusive to the players. I don't even like that it's all on hard courts. I think it should be, there should be softer surfaces. The hard courts, if they do play on hard, they should be cushioned hard. And one of, that's one of the reasons you see a lot of injuries. The players are abusing their bodies. They don't get enough off-season off time. And then to add insult to injury, the guys coming up on the lower level can't make a living. So it, it, the, the sport is so messed up in terms of scheduling, in terms of where the money is, where the money's at, in terms of, I'm going to get into trouble here, but in terms of the format, I think the format of tennis is totally, totally broken for today's world. I think we live in a short attention span world, short attention span society, and that the game of tennis Try not to flame me for saying this, you traditionalists out there, but I just think the game of tennis is way too long. It takes too much time, and it's not good for television. And nowadays, if you want to build a big-time sport, you have to customize it for TV because that's what people want to watch. They want to watch a match on TV and get it done in an hour, hour and a half. And I just think the sport, has the, there's so many parts about the sport that I think are broken, but... You made a great point about the injuries, and if I was a professional player at, at the top ATP level right now, I would be scheduling in more breaks if I, if I could, if I could afford it financially. I think some of the top guys are doing it. I think Fed, Fed does that now to preserve his body. But we need more money spread out to the lower guys. There should be like a league minimum type deal where guys who are 500 to 1,000 can actually you know, make a decent living. They don't have to be millionaires. And there should be a nice off-season, you know, and they, so they don't have to, so players don't have to travel as much and so they can get some rest time for their bodies. You know, all these other sports have an off-season. I'm so jealous of these sports. If I was a pro athlete in tennis, I, I would be so jealous right now of 
basketball guys and the baseball guys and football guys. They get a nice off season with their family. They don't have to travel. They can recuperate and rehab their bodies and just and they got a league minimum. It's amazing. Why is tennis so broken? It's messed up. Okay. Try not to flame me for that, guys. My friend Brandon says, thoughts on the new transition tour or Davis Cup changes? Great question. I've been following the transition tour closely. I'm looking forward to playing a bit on the transition tour in 2019 because it's so awesome that they start qualies on Mondays now. So I'm actually really pumped that I think I can play more transition tour events, even though they don't want us old guys playing. I know I'm going to find some qualies to get into because I'm still hitting the great ball. And now I can go to qualies on Monday after I work all weekend. So I'm super pumped about that, Brandon. But anyway, I think it's mostly cosmetic. I don't understand it. I agree with, I agree with Dave Miley, who says it could have been done a lot better the changes to the transition tour could have could have been much more impactful it's pretty mu they're pretty much cosmetic changes it's still you know the money's not that much better yet i mean we have to get more money for the young guys coming up and what else the you know dave miley says that they they should have made the tournaments four or five days instead of seven days like why does it have to be seven days you know the idea was it, it could be shorter he, he suggested that, that they could do it in four or five and it would be much more financially better for the players because they wouldn't have to hang around the whole week. I think one of the biggest expenses on tour is the, the housing, although there will be more hospitality now. A lot, there's hospitality now, as I understand it, on all the challenger level events, but I'm not, I'm not sure how much on the, on the futures where they call it the world, world tour now, but I think... It, there needs to be more dramatic change, and the change for 2019 at least is pretty minimal and mostly seems to me cosmetic and a lot of branding changes. And I would like to see more substantial change to get more money funneled to those lower ranked guys. And I would like to see a regional tour. I think, from my perspective, the best idea that I've heard, and this is also probably, I follow the work and the thoughts of Greg, uh, of Dave Miley, the former ITF director, and he's so thoughtful, he's so intelligent about these types of issues, and he says that we should probably develop regional tours, and I'm going to go with that. I'd like to see more regional tours. I think that's what they do with PGA. If anyone out there can confirm that or not, but I'd like to see more regional tours so players don't have to travel as much, and I'd like to see a lot more money funneled to the lower ranked guys and maybe shorter, shorter tournament swings so players don't have to shell out for so much in, in housing and, and basically in hotel costs. I'd like to see shorter tournaments that get done in four or five days instead of seven. Those are some of my initial thoughts. I'll have to get out there and see what it looks like. I'll, I'll be playing some events this year. and I'm kind of curious to see what, you know, what it looks like and you know, what, what's, what changes and what, what additions they make. I'm assuming this is the first of some iterations of changes that they will do. I, I hope that they will keep going. Samantha Casella is watching. Thanks for waving. I think you've been on the program before. Thank you. I appreciate my loyal viewers. And I got some thumbs up here. Thank you, guys. Deyada Dokdak is watching. Should I complete my thoughts about Spanish tennis, guys? And how I think Spanish tennis is in trouble on multiple, we're being attacked on multiple fronts right now. I mentioned that in Spain they have to teach, just recapping, in Spain they have to do a better job teaching the serve, teaching a world class serve. All the academies need to do a better job of that. They need to do a better job with their technical parameters and making sure that their players have better world class technique. That directly relates to the serve. Third point about Spanish tennis. Spanish tennis, the academies, the coaches back in Spain, they need to embrace technology. This is a huge one. They need to embrace video, you know, data, 
analytics, the internet, YouTube, Facebook, all the great technologies coming out that, that help with coaching and that help promote tennis and coaching. And in, in my opinion, Spanish academies are so far behind the curve, technologically speaking, they're going to lose market share to other academies that are innovating, other academies from other parts of the world who are innovating. It's a really big concern of mine, and I'm, when I visit next summer, because I, I live in Spain, every, every summer I live there for about a month, and when I talk to my old friends there, I, I'm going to start sounding the alarm a little bit because it's becoming a real issue where you, you can't stop evolving without consequences. There, there are going to be consequences because tennis coaching, like any other industry, is competitive, it's a battle, and the best coaches around the world and the best academies are competing. They're competing just like the pros on the pro tour. And Spain has a lot of competitors around the world now who are doing some cool stuff. They're innovating, they're taking the best of what they do in Spain and maybe interweaving it in their curriculums. They are building upon some of the things that Spain has done brilliantly and they're adding to the Spanish system and they're, they're doing novel and innovative things that, that are going to eventually reflect poorly back upon traditional Spanish programs and coaches and academies who are not on the cutting edge. It's a really big issue. That's why I said at the onset that I will be branding my coaching and my school now as next gen. I want to be affiliated with Spanish tennis because I think that there are still so many genius things that they do in Spain. I believe in a lot of what they do in Spain. And I believe that there is a brilliance to the Spanish method that's oftentimes overlooked or not understood by folks who haven't been there for a long time. But at the same time, I recognize that Spanish tennis has to evolve. They have to get better. They have to use technology. They have to teach technique. They have to teach a big world-class serve. Come on, how can you not teach that? There are a lot of places in Spain that still sort of, if there's a two-hour practice, they do 90% ground stroke consistency, 10% little bit of serve targets. That's not going to cut it in today's game. It's not enough, you know. What do you guys think about that? Mohammed Naj Najay. Sorry, buddy. I'm so sorry. I mispronounced that, but I really appreciate you waving. Ariel Ferrari is watching. Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate it. Brandon, you're firing up the comments tonight. Guys, I feel like I'm losing steam or something. I think I need a snack. I might need to power up with the cliff bar or something. A lot of big detailed questions tonight. Do you think that many Spanish academies do a great job with their development planning? I don't know, man. I don't even know if they're on the cutting edge of development planning. I know they're not using like software for that. If they are doing development planning, I I'm sure some of them do. I'm sure some of the professional coaches do, but are they using an LMS system like a lot of academies are? Are they using some of the new tech for that? I doubt it. You know, maybe Rafa, I think Rafa's, Rafa's academy is positioning themselves as the new generation of Spanish training. I'll give you a few examples of that. They're much more savvy technologically speaking. They're much more savvy in social media and online. They've installed hard courts, all hard courts at the academy, with only some clay courts in the adjacent club, which is crazy when you think about it. This is Rafa Nadal Academy, and many parents are upset when they go there that their kid is not playing on red clay there. This is mind-boggling to a lot of folks. But if you ask Tony about it, 
he makes the case that the game is getting faster and they don't want to teach the old school style of grinding on clay. That is very interesting that a guy like Tony Nadal with his status and his stature will make that argument, basically bashing, undermining, criticizing all the great Spanish academies on the mainland who ushered in the incredible success over the past decades in Spanish tennis, and he's criticizing them, and he's not even working his kids on clay, which is, I think, a big mistake, but he's making that case. Brandon said, yeah, question about development planning. Okay. Michael Furman asks, we talked about the adoption of technology during... Is this one of my YouTube shows? Looks like you put a link there. Guys, there's, my business manager put a link to maybe another show. We're developing a lot of good shows on my YouTube channel. Is that... That's... Yeah, that, that must be on one of, one of my broadcasts where I talk about the adoption of technology. But it's a huge issue in Spain where the academies, they need to get stepped up. They need to step up or they're going to get stepped on by other academies who are innovating. Should I talk a little more about what Spanish tennis needs to do better? Let's see. What do we got here? We got any questions? Paolo Melgarejo. Hope I pronounced that right. Thank you for waving. I appreciate it. We have a steady stream of viewers tonight. A lot of energy and excitement this Sunday night. Troy Yerian is watching. Thank you so much. Michael Furman says, yes, it is. Okay, because I'm getting a little sleepy before I sign off, I want to see if I can coalesce my thoughts on what is next-gen Spanish training. Another aspect of next-gen Spanish training, we talked about serve, technique, technology. Okay, this is a big one. All-court game, it's a big one. They, they have to teach more of the all-court game in Spain. There's a lot of academies that are doing a lot of backcourt grinding, which is awesome. It's really important. I'm a big believer in that. But it can't be to the neglect of developing the complete game. The future is a complete game. A lot of progressive, modern, next-gen type academies and coaches are teaching the complete game. You've got to have a very complete game to win on tour nowadays. All the top guys are doing it. And a lot of the old school Spanish academies got to step up about that. So that's one aspect of complete game. The other part of that is the on the rise and court position. Spanish academies, some of them are better than others. Some of them teach a little bit stronger court position. But a lot of them are still letting players grind from the back fence. 10 feet behind the baseline and they're not encouraging their players to step up and be aggressive on short balls, take ground. I, I made that criticism back in 2014 when I wrote my book, Secrets of Spanish Tennis. So this is not a new criticism, but it's just becoming more magnified as the case against Spanish tennis is made around the industry and around the world. The drumbeat is sounded. People are attacking Spanish tennis. Why? Because Spanish tennis is vulnerable because there's not as many players in the top 100 as there used to be. And Spanish players are getting older and they're going to be retiring more and Spain will probably have like a normal amount of top 100 players, like maybe 6 to 10, which is still pretty good, but they're not going to be like 14, 15 top 100 players like there used to be, like the golden days. So people are seeing a vulnerability. They're making the case against Spanish tennis. I don't think a lot of people in Spain even realize that they're in trouble because they're not, they're not on it in terms of the technology. They're not online as much as they should be. So, All right, there's a few more questions here. Let's see. What do we got? Matt Emery is watching. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for waving. 
Muhammad says, let's see, I'll try to do a few more comments. And it's a long show, but I'm hanging in there with you guys. If you guys are going to stay up with me, I am going to try to stay up with you and continue to talk tennis. Because you guys make me better. Your questions make me a smarter tennis coach. Let's see. Muhammad says, unfortunately, most of the tennis academies working for money not to improve the kids. The kids every day hit tons of balls with repetition and they develop bad habits. Unfortunately, the kids are the victims. Well, I don't know if you're referring to Spanish academies or I, I respect a lot of good academies in Spain. There are many, many good places to train in Spain. I don't want to sound too negative about Spanish tennis, but I'm just concerned. I guess I'm sounding the alarm and I think I have some reasonable justification for being concerned. But I know many professional academies in Spain that do a great job they need to improve on the points that I mentioned but the points that they do well are you know very strong they do some areas very very well and Spain I think will continue to be a tremendous training hub for players around the world international players you will see fewer native-born Spanish players in the top hundred but you will still see a lot of players from other countries who train in Spain uh, who make it on the tour and unfortunately those players don't get talked about as much because they're not technically Spanish even though they may have trained in Spain a long time like you think of guys like Murat Safin and Andy Murray and now you see some of the young guns coming up like Kachanov and a lot of guys a, a lot there's a lot of players training in Spain who we don't often talk about them as Spanish players, but they spent a lot of formative years in Spain. Maybe Spain's their home base. Raonic is another one. And Kachanov's practice partner, Rublev, another guy. So many Russians in Spain. That's a link that a lot of people don't talk about. People don't realize how many players from Russia go to Spain. Germans go to Spain. A lot of the British players go to Spain. It is a destination for many players around Europe and around the world. I think it will always be a destination because Spain is an awesome place. It's got a great culture and it's got great weather. And now it has many, many strong academies and former pros. So many pros off the tour opening up shop there. Maybe they're getting too commercialized with academies. You have to be careful where you go. But I think it will become a desti destination like South Florida. That's what's going to happen to Spain. Okay. Uh, maybe last few questions, guys. I think I'm starting to lose my voice. I might need a snack. And I think I better go to bed because I've got a big day planned for tomorrow. Let's see. Any other uh, late night questions here before I sign off? It's been a really good show. Dion Tennis Swimming is watching. Thank you for waving. Guys, if you have some last-minute questions, shoot them out to me. Did I make a case for next-generation Spanish training methods? I think I have a few more areas that they need to improve, but those are the big ones. And to be honest, in my academy, in my teaching, I'm already doing all those. What I just said, that's next-gen, and that's what I've been doing that for years, and I believe in that. So, you know, teaching the serve well, being a little more technical, working on the all-court game, working on the complete game, making sure players are improving their court positioning. Those are all modern, progressive Spanish ideas. I used to call it progressive Spanish tennis, but now I'm just going to call it next gen. All right, Muhammad says, let's see. Okay, he's from Beijing. Cool, man. I love getting international viewers. He says he's in Beijing. <coughs> and tennis is starting to be big here. And many academies here are using the dreams of kids and parents to gain money. Yeah, it's a fact. Tennis academies are a business. They are. I like Spanish tennis, but as you said, they should teach the kids to play more aggressive. Yeah, some of them do. Some of them are more cutting edge. Some of them are more next gen. And some of them are not. 
what you're seeing with academies, Muhammad, is very common around the world. Academies are a business. They exist to make money. What they do is, I don't like the business model of most academies where they give scholarships to the best players. So those guys train for free. They get everything really good. They get the best training and the best coaching. And then the typical kid is paying full price and he's getting less service. He's getting less expertise. And he's not getting the attention that the top scholarship kids are. So I think that's very, very common at academies. That's why I always recommend to parents, never send your kid to an academy by themselves. Almost never is that going to work out well. The parents who make academies work well for them, they always go on site. They go with their players. So there's a bit of wisdom. If you have a young player, do not send that player off to an academy and just assume that they're going to be well taken care of. Don't do that. you got to go with them. you got to go with the kids to the academy, stay on site, and you have to solicit the coaches and the director there and make sure that your kid is getting a lot of attention. As they say, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. The players who say that they train at an academy and it worked well for them, almost always they have a mom or dad on site. Almost always. It's very rare that a kid's just at an academy and getting the goods, getting good stuff. The parent is there, vouching for the kid, soliciting the coaching staff, advocating for the player, and that has to, that's a constant battle so your kid gets all the attention. That's what the smart parents do. That's where the smart money is. Okay, I hope that helped, Muhammad. Dale Troy is watching. Yes, Dale. How is Alex? Please say hello. Tell Alex to get in touch with me. I need to catch up with him. I, I, I kind of lost track of where he's at, but I really would like to catch up. If you could let him know, I would appreciate that. Okay. Any last questions, guys? I'm going to start wrapping up. It's been an unbelievable show. There was a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. I appreciate all the questions. I hope I helped. Remember, we're here every night, Sunday night, 9.30 p.m. New York City time. We go live on Facebook. Every week we have my reality show, Chris Lewitt, Prodigy Maker. That show is starting to blow up a little bit. We're getting a lot more views, a lot more viewers. I'm really into that show. And, and I promise, right now it's a little raw because I don't have a full production team yet, but I will be getting a production team in the future, and we're going to start cutting up the show and doing different clips and intros and outros, and the show is going to get more and more professional. Just try to hang in there with me as we, we do the raw cuts and the live streaming. And then as the show progresses, we're going to start to make it a lot more professional and more like a TV show. You know, the way it is on, on television. We're going to get into that with the reality show. I like reality shows, so I just decided to make my own. Igor, Igor is watching. It's nice to have you back. I love to see repeat viewers, guys tuning in every week. It's great. Uh, Muhammad, it's really cool that you're in Beijing. Tell your friends. Uh, I guess it's the daytime there, so I guess the timing works well for you. And trying to get more international coaches and followers, more international fans of the show, trying to build that audience. And if you know any families that need advice, I give a lot of advice. I have parents sending me videos. You can always send me videos. That's cool. I, I, I help a lot of families from around the world for free with uh, video analysis and giving them technical advice and things like that. I really like doing that. So if you know anyone in that neck of the woods, in that area, let them know that there's a resource here trying to be of service to the community, the tennis community and families, especially families of, uh, with, with young kids. <clears throat> okay, so wrapping up. Guys, if you like the show, if you wouldn't mind giving it a thumbs up. I know everyone asked for that, but it really helps. And if you could tell your friends, share the show with others and let people know that there is a good service and a good resource out there. Uh, with, I think, responsible coaching advice. And if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
This show is on Facebook, but we archive all these shows on YouTube. If you wouldn't mind going to our YouTube channel, you could just go to YouTube and then search Chris Lewitt. We have a lot of great videos on, on YouTube, instructional videos and stuff like that. So if you wouldn't mind going to YouTube and subscribing, we're trying to build up our subscriber base and build a big community of, of tennis fans, intelligent tennis fans. I see one person subscribed already. Thank you, Troy. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you for subscribing. It's great. We also have a new school. This is the exciting thing. My academy is going digital. I believe that digital coaching is the future. I believe that online coaching is the future. Online education in general as a movement. I'm, I'm a big believer. I'm really into the technology. And we're branching out our academy and we have an online school. Right now you can find it at CLTA, that's Chris Lewitt Tennis Academy, clta.teachable.com, clta.teachable.com. If you go there, you can join our school. It's totally free, and you can start becoming part of our, our online community. And we already have, I think, 30 members of the school, and we're trying to grow that school to have hundreds of enthusiastic tennis fans, intelligent tennis minds, and we, ha we are have courses there that people can purchase. We are going to have, probably do a lot of community building like a Facebook group and things like that. It's, it's going to be awesome. I, wanted, I want a whole community of learners and people that are into my method and into my take, my perspective, and who want to learn my approach to teaching the game. So if you're interested in what I'm doing and my perspective on the game, you can go to clta.teachable.com and we're working on getting a new web address for that, but right now we're on Teachable. Uh, check it out, let me know if you like it. I have already, some of the courses are posted there and we're doing the filming for the courses right now. So these are new digital instructional courses for parents and for players and for coaches. We have coach education too. So I'm really excited about sharing my methodology, my experiences, my perspective with a growing worldwide community online. So check that out. Thank you so much for joining the show. Muhammad says he loved it. I'm so happy. I love to hear that. I'm trying to build a loyal audience and just love talking tennis every Sunday night. Have a great week. I will sign off and see you guys next Sunday, if not sooner, on the Prodigy Maker Show. But thank you so much. Have a good night. God bless. See ya.